Okay, most slick changeover ever. Right, they're shutting the door, so I'm just going to start. Um, this talk is about Git, GitHub, and open source. To put this in context, open source is the story. I'm going to tell you about getting involved with open source, taking the code, looking at the code, maybe doing something with the code for your own purposes, and then maybe one day contributing those changes upstream. So that's kind of the story. Git and GitHub are two different tools, and I will try and distinguish between the two and switch between telling you about those two different things. One tiny confession that I need to make before we go any further. Hello, my name is Lorna. I am at Drupal Camp, and I don't know any Drupal at all. So, excellent. Um, I'm I do know a lot about Git, and I'm going to share some things about Git. I would like to ask questions as we go along, so if you see anything you want to ask me about, interrupt me. I have slightly too much content, so this is going to run quite quickly. If you see anyone ask me a Drupal question, please answer it. <laughs> okay, so GitHub. GitHub's mission statement is this. We make it easier to collaborate with others and share your projects with the universe. That's what they want to do. Git is wonderfully powerful. You can push and pull any branch between any repo, which is great, but very confusing. Um, because it's really, really tricky to keep track of whose repositories are where, what changes are there, what branches they have. And GitHub performs two tasks. First of all, it offers us hosted source control. And it also makes it easy for us to collaborate on repositories, gives us nice interfaces to keep track of what's actually there. I'm using GitHub as my example today because of the number of open source projects that have moved over to it. If you think that GitHub is the only way to do Git, that's a lie. There are some really good competing alternatives, but today I'm going to talk just about Git and about GitHub, and if you want to know what I really think about source control, find me in the bar. Okay, so how to get code from GitHub. First of all, you need to find the project you would like and fork it. You fork it by pressing the fork button, which is up here. If you really, 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 really just want to download code and have a little look at it or use it, press the download zip button just to get the source with no Git involved. But fork it, because we're going to do some other cool things with Git in a minute. Why do we fork? Not every workflow has forking in it. Sometimes you'll just clone. So why do we fork? For open source, we fork so that you've got your own copy. That means that you fork your copy on GitHub, then you have a copy of this project on GitHub, which is public. This allows you to make changes and share them somewhere that other people can see them. If you just clone a repo down onto your laptop, no one else can see those changes. So it's good practice to fork, and it's not particularly complicated. If you really are never going to make any changes, it's totally fine for you to clone a, a repository that you don't have right access to. Just clone it, and you can make changes and keep pulling new changes in, and never, but never push anything else back to GitHub. Once you've forked, or if you're not going to, you need to clone. So. The clone is what pulls that code down onto your machine. You need to grab the URL where the repository you are cloning actually lives. It is here in this pink circle. Um, the guidelines on Git have changed over the last m months, I think. So HTTPS is now the recommended method URL for cloning. You can also um, use SSH, which I tend to prefer, but you do have to set up your SSH keys. Git has, GitHub itself has some really good resources on how to do that. So, clone the repo. We clone the repo and it looks something like this. You do, git clone, the thing you just copied, and it turns us around to itself for a bit. I did ls first, there was nothing there. ls again, and it's created me the repo that I cloned. So it's made a folder, and in that folder is the git repo. That's it. If you're not particularly friends with the command line, or you're not sat in the front three rows, therefore you can't read the text. Um, that's fine. There are lots and lots of GUI wrappers. I use the command line, and I think it's a great and easy place to start. If this is turning you off, that's great. There are other tools. Don't worry. My examples use the command line because I do. Um, cool. Right. So we've got some code. We want to just 
poke at it, find a bit about it, investigate it. You can look at the files in the directory, you don't need me to tell you how to do that. We can also use a command called git log to look at the changes that have been made, the story behind this project. By default, the git log command pipes the output to less or more or something, which means that you type a command and it shows you some stuff, and then you can't get out again. Press Q. Okay, it has run less for you, it just didn't tell you that. Um, the manual page for git log is 26 pages long. I'll spare you the details and just show you my favorite switches for git log. Git log with dash dash one line. That, instead of showing you the full commit SHA-1 identifier and the messages and some other stuff, just shows you the beginning of the identifier and a bit of commit message. You only need this much of the SHA-1 to get a unique on the majority of repositories. So when you're looking at re git revision numbers commit identifiers, you can use, instead of using the whole thing, you can typically use the first five or six characters, and it will be unique. You need a massive repository for that not to work, and git log gives you seven by default. The next switch is dot, dash dash graph, and that's what makes that ASCII arc up the left hand side. This shows you which commits were on which branch and when they merged in, so you can sort of see which things go together. Because Git allows easy branching, commits to be made and then merged in, things very rarely happen in a linear way. I find the graph can just really help me to understand which contributions came from where. I'm an open source project maintainer. I run the joined in project, which we're using today to give feedback to speakers. So all of the development that happens on joined in merges in from someone else's branch via pull request. Nobody commits direct to that repo. So it's, I need that view. I find it really helpful. Dash dash decorate does this stuff in brackets. The red not brilliant on the projection. It lets you see where the last point on each branch is. So you can see where your local branches point to and if the remote branches have got ahead or behind of what you're actually doing. Any questions so far? One person's gone to sleep. Some people are nodding. I think we're okay. Good. So, great. We learned how to use Git. We got some code. We've got that library. We've had a play. Fabulous. What normally happens to me is I grab the library, then I run out of time. And three weeks later, I come back to actually look at this tool that I was so excited about. And of course, there have been changes in that project since I grabbed my code. So staying in sync, whether you've just grabbed code to look at or if you're using someone else's library to build on, is really important. To be able to talk about how we stay in sync, I need to tell you about something called Git remotes. The remotes are addresses of other repositories. You don't check out from Git and get a working copy on your machine as you have done if you've worked with Subversion. The, the thing on your machine is a whole repository, all in its own right, it's totally self-contained, it's got the, all the back history, the branches, everything. The remotes tell Git about the locations of other repositories. When you clone from a repository, by default you'll get a remote called Origin, and that's where you cloned from. So already, Git knows about this one other repository location. I also like to add a remote called Upstream. If I forked, so there was the joined in API, I forked it to Lorna Jane's GitHub account, and then I cloned it onto my machine. So this is my local repo on my laptop. I have the origin remote, which is my fork. Upstream is the main project. So things happen on the main project while I'm busy and so I will add upstream as a remote, and that will enable me to pull changes in from it. I have a picture. I'm waving my hands around. Let's stop doing that. I have a picture. So this is your machine, both the origin, which is what you cloned, and this is the main project we usually call upstream. So you get your own fork. Both of those exist on GitHub, so you can push things to here to let other people see them. So you've added your upstream remote. All we need to do now is pull the changes in. So I'm doing git pull, 
Upstream master. That's a remote name, upstream, main project, master, the branch that I'm pulling into. Master, if you've used a version, master is a bit like trunk. It tends to be the main, main branch, not always. By default it is. So git pull upstream master. Now that's all you, all you needed in order to get an open source project code and to continue to stay in sync with the updates. So if you're just running someone's test suite for them, um, checking that things work on your machine, taking a look at an existing library, you've got all the skills that you need. And what we've actually done there, changes occurred upstream, and we did a pull to get them down into your local, so now you've got those changes as well. Which is nice, but this one's feeling a bit left out. To push your changes back to origin, you just do git push. There's some defaults in there. Normally you would say git push, which remote you want to push to, which branch you want to push to. By default though, git will push back to the origin any branches that exist on both, kind of. So we do the push to push the change back up to the origin. If you haven't worked with remotes before, this might be making your brain explode. It's every <laughs> could be messy. Is everyone okay? Is this making some sense? I want you to know what these push and pull things are for before I go off and do branching. Okay, tangent. Let's go branching. Git and branching. If you have branched in other source control systems, <coughs> um, then you will know that the hard part is not the branching. The hard part is the merging. <laughs> Anyone had a bad experience with an SVN merge? Yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday! Oh, unlucky. So, Branching is, in Git, it's very quick, it's very easy to do, it's very efficient, it doesn't take much time, and it doesn't take much space. We're not literally copying things over, Git will just keep track of any changes. So it's not a whole new code base. Most importantly, merging in Git is equally painless. Some of the same constraints apply if you create a branch, and the thing you branched from, and the thing you branched to, spend some years in parallel universes, yes, your merge will be difficult. So those good practices about keeping things nice and tight and having little feature branches that come off and come back in still apply. But basically, merging is much easier in Git. If you've ever had a bad experience with a source control tool and a merge, don't worry, those things are different. I wish it was called something different in Git. I could, like, just... You wouldn't associate those, those bad experiences. There's something else I need to say about branching for people who have used Subversion but have not used Git. In Subversion, when you create a branch, you then need to check that branch out to another directory on your machine. So often you'll have different virtual hosts or you'll have to reconfigure your virtual hosts and restart Apache to work on different branches. Branching in Git is completely different to that. You have a repository, it's got all the information in it. You create a new branch, okay, and we do some stuff on this branch. Now you want to go back to the first branch, and you just say to your repo, go back to master, and it flips around and presents you the reality of master. So you only need one virtual host setup, you only need one set of config, you're not checking out another branch to another working area and needing like Project one dot local, project two dot local, project we don't need that. You just ask your repository to present you a different reality. This means that when you're working on one thing and hot fixing something else, you are switching branches all the time. It's very quick, it's very easy. You'll see in my screenshots I have a thing on my terminal which tells me which branch I'm on. And it's because I switch branches all the time. And this doesn't stop me committing to the wrong branch, but I find it helps. <laughs> it gives me a chance of realising I'm doing the wrong thing. So that's just an aside. That's something that I found really different about Git when I moved over from Subversion. If you haven't used Subversion before, you'll see and think this is a really good way to work with a repository, and you'd be right. So, Git branching strategies. I don't want to say too much here because every project will have its own strategy. Each project will have its own rules. Some of them will require you to open a ticket in the bug tracker, create a branch on your repo called the same thing as the ticket that's open in the bug tracker, and then open a pull request with it. More on pull requests in a moment. 
you might choose to branch for a feature. So if you're working on a new template, that might go on in a separate branch so that you can hot fix the version that you've got and get the template in when you're ready. Branching is fabulous because it allows you to commit multiple times just as much as you like. You can throw your branch away, you don't have to push it to GitHub, it might be that no one ever sees what you did this afternoon, 18 commits on a branch and actually that was a really bad idea. Let's just throw it away. So the branches are very flexible and I think it's taken me a while, I've been using Git about four years and I now basically never commit to master because branching is very easy and it's a very good way of keeping ideas separate. <coughs> um, right, so to make a branch, this is the worst bit of Git syntax ever because it's really inconsistent. To make a branch, git branch, git checkout, sorry, git checkout, dash b, the name of your new branch. To switch between branches, we just git check out the branch that we want to go to. So you just keep on saying, check out this branch, check out that branch. But if you need to create one, you need to put the dash B switch in to say, I, I need a new branch. And that will create that branch and <coughs> switch you over to it. By default, when you've created a branch and committed to it and it exists on your local machine, it won't get pushed to GitHub unless you specifically ask it to do that. So the first time you want to share that branch publicly to GitHub, or just, I do it to back it up. Like, hard drives do fail. By having my own fork on GitHub, it's nobody's business what I put there. So I will always fork and clone, and then just push all kinds of brain dump branches up to GitHub so that we don't lose them. I'm not proud of all of them, but that's not the point. It, it's about just having that hosted solution. You're not pushing to a central repo, that you know, that history doesn't get backed up by anybody, it's just there. GitHub have got it. So the first time that you want to push a new branch to GitHub in this example, git push the remote that you're pushing to, the branch that you want to push. Once you've pushed it once, the branch is called the same thing locally and remotely, and git push will include it next time. But just the first time, because by default you can keep those branches private, it won't push unless you ask. So try, uh, this catches me out all the time. <laughs> so try and remember that. <coughs> all good so far? I'm a bit freaked out that you're really quiet. Drupal, I don't know a lot about the Drupal community, but they're not normally quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Sugar dip. OK. We've covered the cases where you wanted to get code, look at code, keep in sync with code, maybe make your own little changes and push them somewhere safe. I'm going to look more about how you actually make those changes onto the branches that I just showed you. Making changes in Git, the changes can be in one of three states. So when you first make a change, it's over here in your working area. If you switch branches, um, those changes will come with you. They're just local modifications. So when you first make a change, it's just here in the working area. When you are ready, you may add that change to the staging area. And this staging area dictates what will be included in the next commit, which is great because it means that you can make slightly too many changes because you've had more than one idea. And then when, oh yeah, source control. Um, <laughs> you can curate what goes into each commit. So whether you're creating a file or modifying a file, you then add it, which puts it in the staging area. You can have a quick look, check what's going to be in this commit, and then put that commit, um, make that commit, and it becomes part of the history. So these changes come across. This is your sort of, I am just thinking nothing's happened yet stage. Then when you have to make a conscious decision to include each change in staging. You also don't have to include a whole file. You can just include parts of a file. Um, so you can just run through and be like, yeah, I need to add that new function and my other template that uses it in one commit. And in the next commit, I'm going to add this other code fix where I just saw that we weren't actually filtering that variable. Question? Can you, run, can you run through how you do that, how you break apart a change to a file? Yes. So um, I will demo it when I get to the end. I'm mirrored at the moment, so I'll go back to demo. If I don't, remind me. I will demo how to add interactively with parts of a file. 
Okay, so your friend, to understand what's going on with these three stages, is a command called git status. I type git status like some kind of nervous tick, and it's just like having a quick look around, check what's going on. Git status will show you what stage all of those various changes are in. So it will show you which changes are staged, which files have been modified, Git was tracking them, knows about an earlier version, but you've changed them. And it will tell you about untracked files. So those are new files that you've just added normally, or artifacts that have been generated by something. Files that Git is like, there's some files here, you should just let me know if you want me to take care of those. It won't pick up new files by default, you just say what you want to happen or not. Files which haven't been changed aren't shown, because we don't care, it's all about changes. So it would be huge if we listed every file in your project every time you ran git status. I'm running git status, this is like a story of commits. I'm not sure, if you can, I'm certain you can't read this from the back. If you're, if you're sat at the front, you can. The slides are already online, so you can download them. Run git status, and this says, on branch master, nothing to commit. That's two really important pieces of information. On branch master tells you where you're about to commit to. Always useful to know. Uh, nothing to commit. Okay, good. Nothing. So now I edited, next I edited the readme file. Next time I run git status, it says on branch master, changes not staged for commit. Oh, you can't read the red. That says readme.md. So I edited the readme file and it shows as a modified file there in git status. And let's say I go for a cup of coffee, and I come back and I go, hmm, modified readme.md. Wonder what that was. So, <laughs> my other good friend is git diff, and git diff will show you, with no arguments, just the changes that are in the working area. Do so you have a quick look at your modifications and get a sense of what happened here? Is this one commit or two? Which things do I want to change or stage? Am I done? So, git diff. The other command that I use a lot is git diff dash dash staged. That shows you everything you have added. So it's the diff of your next commit. You can very easily see exactly what you're about to commit. Dash dash staged. That's useful for realizing you've commented something out in HT Access and managed to add it. Not that I do that twice a week at all. Okay. Now, we're getting ready to stage that change. So git add the file, and what I actually did here was I checked out a new branch. So I made a change and then I went, oh yeah, okay, we don't commit that to master, on branch master, let's not do that. So git checkout dash v, I've called my branch readme, and it shows me that I brought modification with me. I'm just showing you this so you get a sense of what would happen. All of your GUI tools will give you similar feedback in a much more pretty way. Um, so, git add, read me. Now when I run git status, it's gone green. If you're using git from the command line, please turn on color.ui equals auto. It will change your life. Um, I'm on the branch read me. My staged changes are readme.md. I'm ready to commit. Before we commit, I want to share some thoughts on committing. I've been running development teams for quite a long time, and I have opinions with a capital O on what makes a good commit. Um, and most of these I've learned the hard way, so I'll, I'll share them with you. Um, try to keep commits very atomic. If you see me commit, if you look at my logs, it's like, added the database patch for so-and-so, made the controller method for so-and-so, and registered the root. Created the templates I need for such and such. Added error handling and the error templates for such and such a feature. And so this one feature, which was like, a form with two fields can turn into five commits over the space of about 20 minutes really quickly. And that's awesome because if I've done something wrong or something shouldn't be there or I fixed the coding indentation on a file, that's just a little commit as well. And if any of them are nonsense, really easy to just pull that out or revert it. So by keeping your commits more and more and more atomic, it's much, much more easy to pull things out and put them back. Meaningful commit messages. Your commit message is a note to your future self. I teach good commit messages to my teams with this single easy step. 
I look for somebody committing with the word fixed, something like that. Put a little reminder on my calendar. Three weeks later, I like to get angry, storm up to their desk, demand to know what was in this fix. And they'll usually write better messages to themselves. <laughs> Most people only need me angry at their desk once. It's genuinely important that both you and I should be able to tell from the commit message, and ideally even just a list of the changed files. You know, is this a new feature? Is it a bug fix? Which part of the system does it deal with? If I'm trying to narrow down a bug, is this the thing I'm looking for? That's what I want to know. Always keep your coding standard fixes separate. I have lost count of the number of times I've rejected a really good feature because it included a coding standard fix that had a syntax error in or something else was wrong with it. There was a reason that we couldn't accept it. So just keep those all separate and then I can have the ones that I want and we can <coughs> go around again on things that haven't worked out the first time. Because Git has its staging area, it makes it really easy to kind of do the brain quite close to the monitor, <laughs> thinking, working at the stuff that you are expert at, changing the things in your themes, in your styles that you are expert at, and then curating the right commits so that this is going to make some sense. Git helps you with that. Okay, you can commit now. Rant over. <laughs> git commit. Dash M and give it a message. You can also git commit on its own and it will open an editor for you. That's where you need to put your meaningful message. All that happens, git commit. You just get a little acknowledgement that that happened. It tells you how big your change set is. And if you run git status again now, it just says on branch readme, no changes to commit. I showed you how to push already. Git push, name of remote, origin. Here I am. Name of branch, readme. And it chunters around, shows you this compressing objects, writing objects thing. Does a little dance for itself and then returns you back to the command line. So what we've actually done there is we've made this local feature, ideally on a branch, depends on your branching strategy. We've made this local feature and we've committed probably a few times into our local branch. We push our branch up to the origin and we don't have right access <laughs> to the upstream. We don't have right access to this. So we're going to request that somebody with right access takes this change and applies it to the project. It's called a pull request. So I pushed up to GitHub, and so you look in my public activity on GitHub, you can see the on a Jane created branch readme. Click on the branch, and you get the option to open the pull request. The pull request is literally saying, hey, you're the project maintainer, can you please pull? I request that you pull this branch that I just created. It's a very nice way of keeping changes separate. Once upon a time, we emailed patches. Lots of projects still do, but GitHub and its social collaboration mission gives us pull requests. It's a very easy way to look at the change, so you can see who changed what. I often get branches coming in as pull requests to my open source project, which have had two or three people pushing changes between them. I mean, commits from multiple people on a branch when it eventually arrives as a finished pull request. Um, so it's a very easy way, easy way to see all the commits. It's an easy way to see the diff. gives you a nice graphical diff. And it's also got great discussion tools. So you can comment on the pull request as a whole, but you can also add notes to individual lines and be like, is there a reason we did this? And then either it gets emerged or more discussion takes place, or there's a place where that collaboration is going to happen. So we go to the new branch and we press the open a pull request button, which is this one indicated with a large pink arrow. <laughs> open the pull request and it just asks you to add some details. If you are contributing to an upstream repo, tell me what has changed. <laughs> then tell me why it's important. Um, I'm, a, I'm probably more ditzy than some open source project leads, but if I don't really understand why it's important or why you've made this change, I, you open a pull request, join in and say, theme is now green. Why would I want that? <laughs> so just explain to me what it is and why it's important. That really, really helps. So we open the pull request in order to get it merged. Once you've done that, you can see it in the list. So it's public on the list um, if it's a public project. 
or if it's private to all the collaborat collaborators, it's public on that list. You'll get an email if anything happens to it. Fingers crossed, that's getting it merged. But if there's discussion, suggestions, or anything out, or it just gets closed. Some projects have a tradition of getting their pull requests closed as the first thing that happens. A bit like PHP.net will close your bug when you open it. That just happens. Good. <laughs> if you don't care enough to go back and reopen it, they're not going to look at it. So some projects have that. Try to get to know them in the IRC channel, get a feel for if that's normal or if your pull request was not useful. Okay, so I just want to say a little bit about contributing to open source. Then I'm going to demonstrate doing an interactive ad. And then I'm going to take any more questions until you run away for lunch because it's more interesting. Right, so when should you contribute to open source? I think it's quite common to think that core maintainers, people who run those open source projects, are like good and noble and smart than their other people. And I thought that too until I inherited an open source project and then, oh, guess what? They're actually quite normal. Um, contribute whenever you can improve a project, even the smallest amount. Um, I have commit, like I'm on the contributors list for lots and lots of different projects, different PHP frameworks that I've barely used, projects in different languages that blatantly I'm not an expert in. Most of the time I fix the readme. Um, I had a project merge, I had a commit merged into GitHub this week because their training materials are aimed at people who know how to set up a Ruby Jekyll toolchain thing. That's not me. So I figured it out and patched their readme. Patching the README is something that I'm so grateful for as a project lead, and it feels like a tiny thing, and you would be worthless if you did it. It's so valuable. So please, if there's anything you can do and you see it, offer it upstream. Not every project will take it, but that's what open source is made of. There's lots of reasons why you might look for something to fix. You might go out and look for an open issue and try and fix it. Maybe you just want to help out with a project that you believe in. <coughs> Maybe you're looking to improve your own skills. I make a living as a PHP consultant. I didn't learn the skills that I use every day at work. I learned them fixing the projects that I believed in. It's also an excellent hobby. Um, I recommend it as a fun way to spend your time. So I said why you should do it. I said when you should do it. How do you actually do that? Most projects will try to help you. Um, GitHub has a standard of having a contributions file. When you open a pull request, you'll be prompted to read the contribution rules, and there will be contribution guidelines. And it'll say what the coding standards are, what the branch should be called. Read those. That's a good place to start. Find out how to get in touch with the project. Um, for joined in, the best place to find us, for example, is on IRC. I'm not there every day because I travel quite a lot for work, but somebody will talk to you if you log in that channel and be like, oh, hey, I have a question. Um, most of them will have issue lists, and the majority of those will have some way of you finding something that somebody who's new to the project could do. On Joined In, we have Easy Pick, and that's pretty standard across PHP, com PHP projects. But you'll find this Easy Pick label that is intended for someone who doesn't have extensive system knowledge already of this product or this, this library or whatever it is. But it's a quick win, and no one's got to it yet. Most projects will try and do that and help you to get in. So if you want to, you now have the tech skills, that stuff is out there. For joined in, it's here. Joined in slash about, you'll find links to the issue lists, the GitHub projects. We have six different projects, so whatever you're interested in, apps, mobile, APIs, and virtual platforms. We have projects running on all of those, which go together to make our ecosystem. Okay. If you have any questions, work on that. I'm going to do Git ad. I'm going to go back to uh, one screen for that. Uh, oh yeah, I Sorry. XR and is not very easy, it's even worse for the audience. <laughs> me a git repo exactly as if I'd cloned. This is the kind of thing I use just to keep changes tracked. 
for my own projects that I may or may not push somewhere else later. So we do git init and we edit a file and we write stuff. This is the loudest letter in the world. And then we'll just do that again. Lovely, right. So I have, let's go through the process properly. Git status, wow. Well, Git status thing.txt, untracked file. So git add thing, git commit. Here's a thing, add thing, right, lovely. So I'm going to edit that file again. And I'm going to make a change here, and here, and there. So, I've made some changes. You can see that it's modified. And if we do git diff, you'll see that we kind of get a few different chunks of change. I'm sorry, you can't see the red, which is the removed lines, or really much of this. Great, OK. So to add, you can see that I've changed Imagine this is like a really long file of functions or something, and I've just changed a few lines. I want to add them in different commits. Do git add. It's dash p, which is for adding patches, and you'll get prompted. So here, this is the bottom of the screen. Brilliant. Here is the first change, and I removed a line really high up in the file, line three ish. And the prompt is stage this hunk. Yes, no, quit. I don't really know what most of those do. One of them does split, which is quite useful. I thought it was S, but that's not listed. Question mark is what you should press now. <laughs> right. Stage this hunk. Do not stage this hunk. Quit. Stage everything after this point. There is a... It is S. S. Split the hunk. So if it's a couple of lines together and you only want one of them, I know. Terminology is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you've still got a sense of humour even at lunchtime. That's amazing. So if you've got a few lines together, but actually they're two different things that just happen to be in the same place, you can split it and it'll just keep on trying to guess what you mean until you literally get a line at a time and you can say yes, no, yes, no. So I say, yes, I'd like to stage this hunk, but not this one, but I will take that new line there. Yes. Its status shows the file as being staged for change and having unmodified changes to it. So if I commit, Git status has some unmodified changes, but it doesn't have all of them because we committed some of them, so there's only one left. So git add with the dash p. I have to say, I git out of the dash p all of the time. I work on a feature, feature looks good, test the feature, write some tests, okay, cool, right, okay, git add, dash p. Do I want this, do I want this, do I want this? There's a var dump. Mm, no. Moving on. <laughs> yes? You know when you were saying there's loads of GUI tools you can use, how yes. well do they cope with that p functionality? I have never used a GUI tool, I'm sorry, I can't advise you. Anyone else know? Anyone else use them? Pretty well. Yes, they do. Pretty well. Question about ad. Who asked me the question about ad? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Any other questions? It's not uh, so much a question, but just going back to when you were talking about good commit messages um, in Drupal context, there is actually a set of guidelines on Drupal.org for that, for how they should be done, that okay. probably not enough people know about. There we are. Fabulous. Perhaps you could tweet the link for us. Yes. Thank there's, you. Al there's also a commit message generator built into Dreaditor, if anyone uses that. There's a commit message generator built into... So does it, when you post an issue on Drupal Org, it has a, there's a standard for how the description is. When you work through it and you're ready to commit, you can hit a button with this uh, Chrome plugin, and it will say issue, blah, 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 list all the committers. It's very nice. Okay, good. good Recommendation standard. for the yeah. commit message generator. Yeah. Someone's thought that through. Yes. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, cool, that's easy. Um, I am only here today, so if you want to ask me any questions about anything you've seen, my open source project or really anything else, I'm not going to even try and reconfigure really my screen again, so you can just have my last slide in PDF view. Um, this is how to get in touch with me. 
I do lots of PHP and Git related training, so um, if you need me for that or as a consultant, just give me a shout. Please leave me some feedback. I'm not accustomed to talking to Drupal people, and I'd love to know how you thought it went. Thanks very much.